I'm Kathy J, the membership director of GLAD New York, the Gay and Lesbian Alliance Against Defamation. Welcome to a brand new segment of the GLAD New York sponsored program, Lesbian Central, which brings you highlights of lesbian art and entertainment in New York City every month here on Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Today we have a very special presentation, a meeting of the minds with lesbian author and activist Sarah Shulman and feminist legend Kate Millett. Sarah is a member of the direct action group The Lesbian Avengers, a playwright, and at the young age of 35 is the author of five novels, The Sophie Horowitz Story, Girls, Visions, and Everything, After Dolores, People in Trouble, and Empathy. Her first nonfiction book, My American History, Lesbian and Gay Life During the Reagan Bush Years, will be published by Routledge this May. Her new novel, Rap Bohemia, will be published in 1995. Kate's first book, Sexual Politics, was published in 1970 and changed the world. She has published a total of eight books after Sexual Politics came, The Prostitution Papers, Flying, Sita, The Basement, Going to Iran, The Looney Bin Trip, and her current release, The Politics of Cruelty. Each of her books is radically different from the other, insightful and important. Let's go now to Kate's law and join Sarah and Kate deep in conversation, their meeting for the first time, in what can only be described as a very important moment in lesbian history. Welcome to a special Lesbian Central presentation, a conversation with Kate Millett and Sarah Shulman. Welcome. We're so excited about having you both here today to talk about all of the issues that uh, have affected lesbians over generation, lesbian artists, activists, which both of you are. I'm just really a sort of in awe because even in our sort of preliminary discussions, I realize that there's so much that I don't know. And I think that in some ways I'm representative of my generation in not knowing these things. And uh, it, it does sadden me that there's so much that has gone come before me that I am not familiar with. Well, I mean, we should start by saying that we probably wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for you. <laughs> so, uh, you know, you and a handful of incredibly brave people that totally transform the world so that we can do what we're doing today. So thank you. I just want to say it. Thank you. That's where we begin. And where we are is in my studio. That's right. In your beautiful studio. You said before that um, my book came out when you were how old? Ten. No, not your book came out, but uh, you were Sexual out of in Time magazine, um, I think, when I was ten years old. Yeah. Well, actually, I have been bragging of my uh, lesbianism to the media. <laughs> who were very careful never to print it. And then when they wanted to use it against the women's movement. That's when it came out. Yeah. Well, I mean, there's something I've been really wanting to ask. I'm so happy I have this opportunity to just talk to you because there's so mm -hmm. much I want to ask you. It seems like from the beginning, well, here you are, this very broad intellectual. You've written on a wide range of topics, everything from Iran to prostitution to psychiatric drugs to love to literature to just the world. You have such a global view. And yet you've been willing to be out the whole time as you look at the world, and there's really no one else that's been able to do that, or willing to do that. There's so many intellectuals who are totally closeted and refusing to include that part. And I was just wondering if you could reflect a bit on that choice and what kind of impact it's had on your life. Hmm. Well, a big one. Yeah. Um, it was a, a big deal for my family, <clears throat> for my mother, uh, and my sisters, and so forth. Um, I'm from St. Paul, where our chief sin is respectability. <laughs> so, <clears throat> mother took it very hard. Uh, and uh, so did the women's movement. I mean, it was a real crease for us. Um, because while we could have a very nice little press conference and all say that we had analyzed it, and mm -hmm. feminism and gay liberation stood for the same issues, personally, Everybody was like up a tree, uh, having all sorts of real tumult in their life. <clears throat> uh, the straight women in women's liberation, the gay women in women's liberation, the closeted ones, the partly closeted, the sort of uh, just out of the closet last week. Uh, it was a time of enormous upheaval and change in people's lives. Uh, change in their, their lifestyle, which is probably the biggest threat that the gay liberation holds, mm -hmm. is that it's a real a big change in how you live and how you think about things. It challenges the roles and all the rest of that behavior. 
uh, it would have big effects on war and peace and really? whether citizens obey the government and <laughs> the all that kind order of stuff. Of yeah. <laughs> so, um, and here it arose in the middle of women's liberation, which had, it thought, a hard enough struggle mm -hmm. <coughs> for it to join issue with something still more dangerous and so forth. So I always felt like this sort of linchpin. <laughs> <laughs> but do you think things. that you've been excluded in some way from participating in the intellectual debates of the, of the intellectual life of the nation because you've been out? I mean, yeah, and from the moment that Tim uh, did its attack on me, um, because I had been telling them all along they could print this any time. In fact, I insisted that they printed my membership in radical lesbians and things like that. But they wanted to make an attack on the women's movement. They used me as a way to attack the women's movement. And from that point on, I was in sort of an invalid person, or spokesperson, mm -hmm. so that I really never appeared on television much after that, except, oh, say, on behalf of this and that book I had written. But this is after sexual I was projects. kind of like, they turned the knob, and I was off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so are you angry at other intellectuals who have remained closeted all this time? No, I don't think so. Um, I think it's, you know, sad and deplorable and probably really limits their life and stuff like that. I, th I can also remember when nobody, nobody, nobody would ever come out to you see. So it seems to me that they're flocks <laughs> at this point. Um, but I think in a lot of ways I've been, I got turned off at that point. They, they just pulled my plug as a spokesperson said, for the women's movement. In lots of ways. I mean, not within the movement, but within the media and, and so forth. Not in Europe, but here. And uh, so that then I think I, I was marginalized as a writer and as an intellectual and as a, you know, whatever one hopes to be, sometimes a moral force and so forth. Um, and because I was a political activist, I was kind of marginalized in the literary thing anyway. Even though I had, you know, your sort of ideal education, Oxford, Columbia, and PhD, all sorts of honors, right. and like that. but um, it's made it uh, uh, a bit harder and uh, more isolated and so forth. I'm also a visual artist, which makes it <laughs> still another kind of creature. But but the thing is, your subject matter is so much broader than feminism. I mean, you've written about Iran and, I mean, are you ever included in debates on Iran or debates on psychiatric drugs or any of your other subjects? Well, the English <laughs> uh, um, and so forth, when the Looney Bin came out. But um, again, then, you know, I was a renegade and an outlaw, sort of. I mean, after all, I was deeply questioning psychiatry and so forth. So um, it took five years to get that book published. Mm -hmm. uh, my publishing history is kind of fascinating. Yeah, I really want to hear more about that. <laughs> I was meant to write something about it. Uh, I once got a $11 royalty from Italy, and I thought, since there's really very little you can do with $11, <laughs> uh, you have to think about it a long time. And um, there had seemed to be only one meaningful thing you could do with $11, and that was to buy a quarter of paper. Um, a ream, 500 sheets, maybe two of them in the old days, if you could get a deal. <laughs> there was a long time I didn't publish between, say, 80 when The Basement came out mm -hmm. and 90 when The Lady Venture came out. Mm -hmm. uh, and it isn't that I didn't write, it's just they wouldn't touch it. What do you find? You find it easier? Is it easier now? Book tours? Or no, getting publishing. published. Getting published. Because you've had your getting own to do problems what you with want. I have the dream editor of the world, Good. Carol DeSanti. Mm -hmm. And she, you know, we worked together for eight years. Mm -hmm. I love her. Mm -hmm. And uh, if it wasn't for her, I wouldn't be in print because there's no other option for me. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like I have one per the one person who's been out and willing to acquire mm -hmm. lesbian books mm -hmm. who's been very heroic. But mm -hmm. every... As far as I know, up until just a few months ago, almost every other lesbian editor in the mainstream was still in the closet. Oh, and sure. gay men don't care at all. You mm -hmm. know, they're not interested at all. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that was it. I had no other, I had no other options. Mm -hmm. So as long as she remains employed, I feel mm -hmm. like I'm fine. Mm -hmm.
You know, I mean, you know, obviously the marginalization, it's very different than what you initially encountered. It has a new form now, but mm -hmm. it's still mm -hmm. extremely in place. Mm -hmm. When a book comes out with a lesbian theme, you're competing against every other book with a lesbian theme, even if you have nothing else mm -hmm. in common. Mm -hmm. You're never compared mm -hmm. to American literature or considered yeah. part of that yeah. mosaic. Yeah. And, you know, that persists. But um, actually, increasingly, I've been noticing that a lot of my peers have been obscuring the lesbian content of their books most, more recently mm -hmm. because uh, they just don't, are sick of that marginalization. Mm -hmm. So if you're talented and ambitious, that's much more tempting now, whereas for a few years people didn't do that because it looked like things were going to change. Mm -hmm. That's sort of how it is right now, I think. And you're talking about your peers that publish with mainstream publishers, not lesbian. Yeah, well, it's interesting because I was realizing recently when I first started, there were two assumptions I made that turned out to be wrong. Mm -hmm. The first thing was I thought that people older than me who were closeted would come out, and they never did. Uh -huh. Mm. That's the first thing. And the second thing mm. is I thought that my peer group would have integrity about being out, and they really haven't. So mm. there is this mm -hmm. par parallel. Mm -hmm. you know. mm. Mine, I don't think, will have that integrity either. So <laughs> it's just a lost hope. <laughs> because I think the, that my generation sort of sees it as not necessarily important to be out in this, in, as an artist. I mean, it's because something that I'm not going to be closeted about, but I'm not necessarily going to oh, well, the interesting ask them to print it in my bio. All right. Yeah, the author's bios are the big giveaways. That's where people are not out in their bios. But, I mean, like, now look at a movie like Philadelphia, for example. Mm -hmm. Who are speaking for gay people? Straight men. Mm. You know, but that's not, but film about, by gay people about AIDS has been made for 14 years, but no one's ever seen it. Right. Although Ron Nicewaner, the screenplay writer, is a gay Right, writer. but still, it's not, a, you know. The point of view is certainly not. Uh, no. If you look it's at the difference the audience, gay it's not a movie that's made yeah. for gay people about their experiences. It's made for straight homophobic people. <laughs> yes, that's right. You know, see themselves reflected. That's Absolutely. Right. Mm -hmm. So there's certain changes, but they're they're not what I think people anticipated or desired. It's like there's a new kind of there's a public homosexuality which is palatable, mm -hmm. marketed and presented by straight people, mm -hmm. and, and <coughs> there are hundreds of little businesses that are selling like. T-shirts and buttons off. Right. Uh, <laughs> but the merchandising uh, part of the lesbian yeah, community. Well, whatever. Um, and uh, millions of people getting grants and doing things and making little corporations and getting 501c3s and stuff. But it doesn't seem to get to be any easier to be uh, a pioneer. No. Uh, and I think it, it's quite true what you say that you don't get the sort of support you you justifiably could expect um, out there in the market and mm -hmm. in that tough place. That's true. Yeah. And yet you've managed to publish seven or eight books. Mm -hmm. And the first book, the Sexual Politics, was that the first book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Which Sarah has said changed the world. That's right. After that book, was it easy to get another publishing? Year? No, because Brian was entirely shocking. And Double Day, who had really made different. a whole lot of money on Sexual Politics. Mm -hmm. And the editor got boosted way up the ladder and so forth. She couldn't touch it. Well, that was a lesbian passion. That's quite a different subject yeah. matter. <laughs> they had very <laughs> different ideas of what autobiographical stuff from like well-known persons mm -hmm. should sound like. Were you yeah. asked to write your biography? No, I wanted to write a book in my own voice. And that's what I thought it was. And I had more fun writing it than anything else. And I still think it's deeply subversive. Oh, I agree. <laughs> this fabulous book, by the way. The, book. <laughs> the latest book. An incredible new book by Kate Millett, uh, is about the world. In terms of I'm people. fascinated that you reviewed this book. Oh, yes. Let's talk about your new book. Yes, The Politics <laughs> of Cruelty by Kate Millett. I, yeah. Um, well, you know, a, a number of the subjects that you covered, this is about uh, political torture and its role globally today. And you have a wide range of examples which you've gone into in great depth. But you know, uh, the one example which I had any familiarity with was the World War II, and mm -hmm. then that was uh, it's something that I've read about my entire life, and I thought mm -hmm. I really understood. And yet, you unearthed mm -hmm. all of this level of understanding and analysis mm -hmm. that I had never seen before. Mm -hmm. So, if, if that's any indication of the depth of understanding the book, it's quite an astounding book. So, congratulations. Mm -hmm. But my question is, in this, in this increasingly pop uh, level of social discourse, 
How, how many people do you think are going to want to read about political torture as a subject and really go into it in the depth that you do, that you provide? Well, probably a lot, because it's one of the greatest social and political problems we have in the world right now. One of the biggest things facing the United Nations. Um, when you think of how important amnesty and the non-governmental things are, um, of the evils in the world at the present, this is certainly one of the greatest. Right, but that's not my question. I'm not questioning its, its role in daily life for many, mm. many people. But uh, something which you discuss quite a bit is all the machinations that people go through to repress any discourse mm. about mm. it. And, uh, and it just seems increasingly that what is popular is what is comfortable. And there's something very mm. uncomfortable about mm. the subject matter. To say the least. Right. I can't think of anything more horrible than torture. Um, I guess that's why I wrote about it. It's the most profoundly upsetting thing I could think of. And I've been sort of forced to deal with it a little bit and through political affiliations, particularly around Iran. <clears throat> so I had to get informed. And the more I read, the more um, I had to do something about it, as it were, in mm -hmm. my drop in the bucket. OK, maybe this is a good time for us to take a little break. We'll be right back after this with Kate Millett and Sarah Schumann. Kate Millett reads from a work in progress. I'm going to read a little bit from a book that hasn't been published yet about my mother. Um, and the way things are in my life, I never know if I'm going to get something published anyway. So <clears throat> we'll have some life here, but hopefully it'll be out someday too. Uh, I've been working on it, uh, revising it recently, because uh, my mother died last September, which is something that you will probably all have to face. And let me tell you, it's a real bomb in your life. I mean, it is just an enormous explosion that <clears throat> is very hard to live through or recover from. And uh, this is kind of a consolation because Mother was still alive at this point, so I still had her. So in revising text where she's still a living person, I, I had a nice contact with her. <clears throat> I'm home on a visit. There are only two things I'm afraid of, Mother said later, after we got home from dinner. Our first talk, probably the best one. Just two things staring straight ahead. That tone, stone, terrible stare of courage or despair I've seen in her plenty of times, always the worst and most essential times. My commitment hearing, for example. I'm scared of falling and of nursing homes. You're safe with me, I think. I've been put away. I'm not likely to do it to anyone else. Maybe I even say it. I'll never put you in a nursing home. Knowing damn well, I don't make these decisions anyway. Sal does, the eldest. Though I would fight Sal, I would probably lose. And what substitute do I have? Sally has told me I could go to her. She has room in that new house. She said that she and Ruth both had mothers, and they had extra room just because of that. I admire my sister, a better daughter than I. But I don't want to be a burden. The word burden, more terrible than fate itself, because mother is between Scylla and Charbatus and cannot die when she wishes, may have to live longer than she wants to be alive. Already she has reached the point of diminishing return. She says it fairly open now, looking at the 96 years her sister Mary lived. Margaret, her eldest sister, living out in Excelsior, is going to be 99, bright as a dime, sprightly, able-bodied, a great conversationalist. Mother is 88, and there are probably moments when she must feel captive in life, with a body that betrays her, yet will not release her either. Does she think of suicide, I wonder? She had that living will business notarized years ago, even before it was popular. But suicide would be a matter of means. Would Huxley's Hemlock Society be available to her, to her remaining Catholicism, St. Paul respectability? Too much to imagine. Yet one sees the predicament, the feeling she must have of being trapped in life. Moreover, the two precipices of the nursing home or the burden are just there, 
One slip and you fall. At the moment, she is in a state of absolute grace. The doctor has just given her a checkup and proclaimed her to be sound as a dollar. He says, I'm just about perfect, she laughs. He forgets to mention that I can hardly walk, even though they can't find anything wrong with my legs. And I can't hear with a damn either. She will adjust to neither of these infirmities, hates the walker, was ashamed I should see it, warned me over the phone in a solemn voice that she was really old now. I should not be shocked when I see her. God, how I hate for you to see me in this condition. I reassure her, I beguile her with humor, as I have always done. Court her with teasing, flirt, exaggerate, bring out the girl in her, coax out that approbation, her laughter, has always amounted to, that amused surrender of judgment. If I can make her laugh, I can make her accept the wildest ideas. I even know about the pampers at night. Nothing faces me. Welcome back to Lesbian Central's conversation with Kate Millett and Sarah Sherman. So what is your next project going to be? Mm, I've got a couple. Uh, I'll, I'll be revising a book about my aunt, which I did quite a while ago. And um, the one on my mother. Um, and then I have another text, which oh, is so far from being finished, but um, it deals with an intergenerational love. I think it's <laughs> one thing that, that you know, lesbians haven't dealt with at all. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> um, but there's probably an awful lot we haven't dealt with. Um, when I did CETA, most of the uh, emphasis in these wonderfully hostile reviews <laughs> was that, um, oh my God, this wasn't a good relationship. And I guess I should have written something that would be like an advertisement. Mm -hmm. Russian positive um, yeah. Harlequin lesbian romance novels. Yeah. Um, there's there's a, a great deal of I think we're still living kind of at a fantasy level. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. lesbian detective stories and stuff. Yeah. <laughs> no, I know. Uh, it's really pathetic on a lot of levels because the literature mm -hmm. is so primitive. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, I recently judged a lesbian writer's contest and mm -hmm. I read like 350 pieces of fiction. Wow. And they were all basically four or five ideas recycled. There was, mm -hmm. you know, lesbian detective novels, which although I've written Two, I really have to say that I think no more should ever be, we don't need any more on the face of the earth. <laughs> I wasn't aware you ever wrote Detective. Well, Sophie Horowitz was the third well, one I in, guess in so the world, well. but now there's way too many. And um, the other I thing. I never read them that way. I was thinking <laughs> it was comedy. Oh, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> A very hard thing to write, too. Uh, and then there's, you know, the 50s bar mm -hmm. thing. Mm. And then there's like, um, you know, the ethnic voice or whatever, the dialect, mm -hmm. Jewish dialect, black dialect, working mm -hmm. class. Dialect. And it was all like five formulas and that was it. And I thought, you know, so little is known about lesbian literature and yet people are re repeating the mm -hmm. little territory that's already mm -hmm. been staked mm -hmm. out. There's a fear of... Meanwhile, one isn't describing very much lesbian experience at a rock bottom, real level. Right. Yeah. Well, you know, you had said, you said it so much better than I can say it, but that Kate, allowed you to sort of cross over into the popular sort of well, well the, if Kate had never existed I would never have been able to write what I've been able to do and and you know we're all it's all one big gener you know generational multi-generational family here passing down what we what we know okay well I want to thank you both I've really enjoyed this and I think we've we've made history <laughs> thank you Sarah Shulman <laughs> Kate Miller. If you'd like to get involved with GLAD New York's work for more fair, accurate, and inclusive representations of lesbians in the media, give us a call at 212-807-1700. Thank you.
Thanks for watching Lesbian Central.